I'm going to be doing something a bit different today, which is to take you all through the process of translating Japanese sword inscriptions and starting to look at the areas of an inscription that you will commonly see in terms of their structure. Uh, so in order to facilitate translating Japanese sword inscriptions, I created a few tools on my website uh, as a quick reference. I'm just going to show you those right now, and they live within swordsofjapan.com under the library section of my site. Uh, so if you go to library, you'll see that I have a, a few sections here that are uh, Mei or Nengo specific. Uh, so you have provinces, and the provinces are organized by the Japanese roads. Uh, so you'll see you have the a phonetic reading of a province or a location, then you have the kanji uh, that's associated with it. Going back into the library, I have a Nengo listing, and here we have the chronological list of all of the time periods from the Heian period uh, up to Heisei, and I'm going to update this with Reiwa, which is the current era uh, that we're living in right now, and then uh, quickly under Nanbokto, you're going to see that we have those two parallel time periods, the northern court and the southern court. Uh, going back to the library area, we have our kanji for Japanese swords, and this is likewise a uh, phonetic reading of different kanji. There is a lot of duplication here because a, a kanji can have more than one phonetic reading. Uh, so the idea here is that if you're looking at an inscription, see if you can match it up against uh, something that's listed on this page or one of the other uh, kanji resources, and then you'll see one or more options uh, for uh, for the reading of that particular kanji. And the purpose of trying to refine uh, your reading down to a particular kanji is that we have tools available online to be able to search from Swordsmith databases by, by kanji. So just to show us an example here, if I know that uh, an inscription contains, let me see something which is a, a common kanji that we see I'm going to copy the kanji for Yoshi, highlighted, copied. Uh, we have an excellent database of Japanese sword inscriptions called, let me go ahead and paste this in, and then I'll go back to see the full website, Nihonto Club. Uh, so here I've identified that one of the kanji in my Mei uh, is this character for Yoshi. I'm going to go ahead and apply, and then we're going to see all the Japanese swordsmith results that contain Yoshi. Uh, now let's say, for example, it's just a two-character inscription, so I want to look for uh, inscriptions that start with Yoshi. And it's not going to be that many, uh, but here we have uh, Yoshishige, we have Yoshisuke, which is also pronounced Gisuke, which is an example of uh, multiple uh, readings of the same kanji that we see. And here, if I have a, uh, a two-character inscription, perhaps Yoshinori, or a three-character inscription, perhaps it's something like a Yoshisuke, a Yoshishige, or a, or a Yoshisuke. And this site is excellent, uh, and the uh, ability to be able to search by one or more kanji combinations, it really uh, facilitates the process of, of doing a translation. So I'm going to jump over to showing the structure of different Japanese swordsmith mei, uh, so we can start to see some of the common patterns uh, that you see in, in sword inscriptions. Uh, so typically, the general format that we see of mei are that they will start with a location. So in this case, we're looking at an inscription of the first generation Hizen Tadayoshi. Uh, and the first two kanji in the mei are Hizen. A common kanji to see in Japanese swordsmith mei is this kanji here for kuni. So when you have those combined together, we have an inscription that begins with hizen no kuni, referring to hizen province. And then most often, and this is just a generality, the end of the inscription will contain the Japanese swordsmith name or the name plus uh, a certain character or multiple characters that refer to the fact that this individual made the sword. So here we have the ending of this mei is Tadayoshi, referring to the swordsmith Tadayoshi, and then collectively we have a goji mei, or five character inscription of Hizen no kuni Tadayoshi. 
So now I'm going to jump into another very common May uh, that we see, which is uh, Bizen Skeisada. In this case, the May that we're seeing here is Bishu Osafune Skeisada, and we have the similar kind of structure that we saw with the Hizan Tadayoshi May. We start with the inscription Bishu, which refers to Bizen province. The next two kanji are Osafune, which is a village uh, in Bizen, and at the very end here we have Skeisada. Now we're going to look at another variation here. Most often the orientation that we see of this inscription is the most common. Uh, so Bishu Osafune Skeisada vertically down to the end of the Nakago, but sometimes when a sword is shortened, the individual who did that process will do what we're seeing here, which is a folded over may called an Orakaishi may, uh, in which case the sword was shortened, but the individual took the time to make sure that the may was preserved. And here it's been folded over and reversed. Uh, so it's upside down on the Nakago, but what we're seeing in terms of the may itself is the same uh, may that we saw just previously, Bishu Osafune Skeisada as an Orakaishi may. Another more complex uh, May structure that we'll see is uh, the presence of a title. Uh, so here, just like the Tadayoshi May that we saw, we start with Hizen no Kuni, Hizen Province. We end with the May of the Swordsmith. In this case, it's Masahiro, who is a student of the first generation Tadayoshi. Uh, but then under the province, we have our Swordsmith title. And the title that we're looking at here is Kwachi Daijo, uh, Lord of Kwachi. And there are a number of different titles out there. Typically, the titles do not have any relationship to where the individual uh, was working. So he didn't reside in Kwachi, but he was given the formal title of Kwachi Daijo. Uh, and then this is the May of the first generation Masahiro. The second generation used the formal title of Kwachi no Kami, uh, which is a one tier above in terms of the titles. And then we have uh, underneath that, uh, Fujiwara. Fujiwara is a clan. Uh, when we see clan names, Fujiwara is probably the most common that you will see. Uh, and then after that, Minamoto, which is another clan, and Taira as well. But you know, I would say the majority of clan names that we see in, in terms of you know clan integrated within a, a May inscription would be Fujiwara. And then collectively here we have the full inscription of uh, Hisa no Kuni, Kwachi Daijo, Fujiwara, Masahiro. So that's it for the for the current round. Uh, I just want to quickly mention that uh, there is a tool uh, exists which allows you to do a search by the radical. So if you are looking at a may and you cannot identify the kanji easily, uh, this website will allow you to look by the component parts of the kanji to identify uh, which kanji it is in order to be able to put that into the swordsmith searchable database. Uh, so kanji are typically composed of radicals, and radicals are smaller subset characters that are built together to create the kanji. Uh, so for example, if we're looking at a kanji uh, and we see that one of the portions of it contain this character here that I've just highlighted, that will allow us to look at all of the kanji that contain that radical and we identify that it's actually this kanji here for shige that we're really looking for. So here that would allow us to go back into the swordsmith database, paste in the kanji for shige, do a search, and it's already been set to uh, identify inscriptions that start with a kanji, and here we have all of the mei in this database that begin with a kanji for shige. Uh, so few of the tools that I use on a day-to-day -day basis doing translations, and I hope that uh, looking at the tools, looking at some of the pages that I created on my website, and then looking at some of the May formats will help to facilitate that process of learning how to read Japanese word inscriptions. And something I feel very strongly is that uh, for anyone who is serious about this field and who plans to make the study of Japanese swords a long-term part of their life, learning how to read inscriptions is extremely important. Uh, and I would say to go a step beyond that and use tools like flashcards uh, or other formats of studying the Japanese language uh, to become familiarized with, uh, with at least the more common kanji uh, that we see. 
because you know, most likely you will not learn every kanji that appear in every mei, but if you have familiarity with 25% or 50% of them, then you really accelerate the process of being able to identify who made this award that you're looking at. So I hope that this was helpful, and I will be following up with more videos uh, going into a greater depth on uh, Japanese sword May, uh, date inscriptions, and then uh, more variations on the structures that we see in, uh, in Japanese sword May. Okay, so thank you so much, and I'll be coming back with more videos soon.